Pleasant Valley. It's good to see you from by way of video. Uh, we're going to sing some songs, and then uh, Brianna is going to come and sing special, and then Brother David will come and preach.
Good morning. Good to see each one of you here today on the Lord's Day. And if you have a Bible, if you'd turn to Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, we're going to be reading a few verses there, and then we're going to be turning to Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15. So Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 24, and we'll read down through verse 30. Mark 7, beginning with verse 
24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. If you turn to Matthew chapter 15, and I want to read verse 21 through 28. This is the same story except Matthew's account, and this is going to be the account that we're going to follow most closely today in our message. So we'll be referring back to Mark some, and, but mostly here in Matthew. Matthew chapter 15, beginning with verse 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Well, this morning we are continuing our exposition through the Gospel of Mark, and if you're visiting with us through way of internet, we have been preaching through the Gospel of Mark, verse by verse, and we have all of those sermons online on our website from Mark chapter 1, verse 1, all the way up to today. But here we have a wonderful story about a Gentile woman who comes to Jesus, and her life is changed forever. Now, we must keep in mind the audience that Mark is writing to. Mark is writing this gospel from Rome, and he's writing an account of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for Gentile readers. Primarily, that's his audience. Now, obviously, it extended to everyone, but his primary goal is to write for the Gentile world. And it's important to Mark that he communicates in his gospel that the gospel message extends to the whole world. Now, you would not get that message that the gospel extends to the whole world talking to the Jews of the New Testament times because Jews viewed the Gentiles as outcasts. They viewed them as aliens from the covenant of God, separated from the life of God. From the purposes of God. And so to borrow some language from the Apostle Paul, they saw the Gentile world as cursed, under divine judgment, without hope, and they alone were the ones, the Jews, who would receive the great benedictions and 
benefits of salvation. Their mentality, though, shows their misunderstanding of the Old Testament. They had become very isolated from the Gentile world, and generally speaking, they were hostile uh, to the Gentiles around them. But that was not the attitude of our Lord, nor was that what the, is what the Old Testament promised. And so in this text, we have before us, Jesus leaves Israel, and he goes on a long trip deep into Gentile territory. He is in the last year of his ministry, earthly ministry. The gospel ministry in Galilee has been going on for over a year, and there are not a lot of believers. Most of those people rejected Jesus, and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, they, they hate him. They are looking at ways to trap him. They want him dead. They're plotting on how they can kill the Lord Jesus. Now, there will be a national rejection and a cry for his death soon to come. But there will be enough Jews in the kingdom of God to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. You have then in this story a preview, really, of that ministry that will extend beyond the Jews to the Gentiles. And we're going to follow, as I said, Matthew's account more closely because it fills in the details of the story for us. And as I studied and read the account, it just really spoke to me. So here we have an amazing story. It's an amazing story of a heathen woman who knew very little about Jesus, who comes to faith in Jesus, and at the end of this encounter with Jesus, Jesus declares that this woman's faith is a great faith. It's amazing. Here we see Jesus is doing a work in her life. Jesus is developing her faith. He's maturing her faith. But he's doing the work in contrary ways. Jesus is bringing great, great trial into this heathen woman's life to mature her faith, to develop her faith. We see in this account in Matthew, there, there's the word but. But. Three times in this text, if you look at verse 23, the Bible says, but he answered her not a word. Verse 24, but he answered and said, I was not sin except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. So how does Jesus develop this woman's faith, mature her faith. How does he develop our faith, mature our faith in the face of all these obstacles? All these obstacles that are presented to this woman. All of these buts stand in the way. But, but, but. Can I ask you this question? What kind of Christian do you want to be? What kind of Christian do you want to be? I mean, if we were to put it on a scale and we would say, you know, one being very poor and ten being the very best, what would you say on that scale? What kind of Christian would you like to be? Would you say, well, I really just want the minimum, David. Uh, maybe a two or a three, just enough to get me into heaven. Or some might say, well, I'd like to be a five or a six and or would you say, man, I want to be a 10. I want to be the best Christian I can be. I want to be an excellent Christian. I want to be growing. I want to be developing. I want to be maturing in my faith, living a life of holiness. I want my affections and, and my will and my all consecrated to you. I want to be sold out to Jesus Christ. Would that be you? But you know, if that's our desire, there's so much that stands in our way that's so contrary to those desires coming to fruition. 
There's so much there in my flesh. There's the world. There's lust. There's desires that war against me. How can I ever be consecrated to God? How can I ever be holy? Be what God wants me to be. How can I grow in grace and knowledge and become more like my Lord? There's so much that, so many struggles. And how does God take these desires and turn them in to fruition? Well, that's what this story is about today. It's how God develops our faith. This story before us is a surprising story. It's an amazing story. You're going to see as we work our way through the passage just how amazing it is because this heathen woman who comes to faith in Jesus and at the end of this encounter, he says, great is your faith. That's what Jesus is doing in this story. He's developing her faith. He's maturing her faith. You may have read this story before and say, man, I, I don't quite understand what's going on. What is Jesus doing? Well, that's what he's doing. He's developing this woman's faith, and he does it in a surprising way, the most surprising way. And there's so much here for us to learn because Jesus deals with this woman in a way that we would not expect him to do. You see, you have to always remember that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are are not our thoughts. God is greater than us. And the way he deals with man sometimes might not make sense to us, but God knows what he is doing. So the title of this message is How Jesus Develops Our Faith. Notice number one on your outline. Jesus develops her faith through apparent silence. Look at verse 23 in your Bible. Matthew 15, verse 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. So what I want you to do this morning is I want you to come with me this morning just outside the boundaries of Israel. And here is this woman, and she's at home. And as we look at her, she has tremendous problems. This woman has a mess on her hands, like many of us do in life, because life is burdensome, and there's difficulties. I mean, is life not messy? And, but here's this woman, and her life is, is, there's this incredible cross that she has to bear. You say, well, what is the cross? Well, it's her daughter. Her daughter is possessed with a demon, with a devil. And it is with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's ever there. Every waking moment, this woman is facing this reality of this little girl, her little girl that's possessed with a devil. And she don't know what to do. She's tried all the positions. She's tried all the means in that day to get help but to no avail. And no doubt this woman is very frustrated and helpless and no doubt you can imagine she has probably shed many tears over this child. This is her daughter that she loves so dearly. But she hears about Jesus. If you go back to the Mark passage, Mark 7 and verse 25, notice what the Bible says. Mark 7 in verse 25, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, notice that, and she came and fell at his feet. So she heard about Jesus. Possibly she had been in Galilee and heard of this amazing man, and she maybe hears. He's open blinded eyes. She, he's unstopped. Deaf ears. He heals the sick. Oh, she's even heard that he cast out devils. She may have heard that before people even calls out, he answers. And she says in her mind, in her heart, could it be? 
Could it be that if I go and I call out to Jesus that he will help me with my problem, that he'll hear me, that he'll help me with my demon-possessed daughter? Could this be my answer? We have no idea what kind of obstacles and pressure she faced living in this foreign land. You can almost picture in your mind, can you not? Her neighbors and friends and families, they came to her and they say, you think you're going to go to the Jewish Messiah and he's going to help you? <laughs> Don't you know that we Gentiles, we're viewed as dogs. Everyone has their own local deity and even if he's in some way godlike, he's not going to help you. He's Jewish. But, and don't miss this, through the Holy Spirit, a seed of faith is planted in this woman's heart. It's quite remarkable. She comes to Jesus. And notice when she comes to Jesus, she does not come to Jesus saying, Jesus of Nazareth. No, not Jesus from that despised place of Nazareth. No, she comes and she says in verse 22, Oh, Lord, son of David. That's amazing. Because she is using the Messiah title for Jesus. And you say, well, that's remarkable. It is. And the Bible even calls attention to it in verse 22. Look at what it says. And... Behold, I mean, it's saying, wow, look at this. This is something else. A woman from Canaan came from the foreign coast and came to Jesus and called upon him and said, Lord, the son of David. We begin to see this faith has begun in her heart. And she believed in Jesus. And she come, despite all of the opposition that she faces of her neighbors and her family, but she can't stay away from Jesus. She comes to Jesus. You see, listen, that is the quality of saving faith. Faith, saving faith, can't turn its back on Jesus. Faith's object, one object, is Jesus. It must go to Jesus. It must live out of him. It must abide in him. Faith loves Jesus. So she comes to Jesus. She sees Jesus. And she pours out her heart and tells him everything. What does she say in verse 22? She said, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. And it's interesting, in the Greek tense, the word means that she told it over and over and over again. The streets are, are ringing with her cries. Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord! Son of David! Son of David! Have mercy on me! Have mercy on me! My daughter is demon-possessed. The street is ringing with her cries. But what? Well, she's come to Jesus. She stated her case. And you say, well, Jesus is going to hear her cries. He's going to answer her and, and, and heal her daughter right away. What does verse 23 say? But he answered her not a word. The willing, loving Savior answered her not a word. The loving Savior and friend silent. The poor beggar woman coming to Jesus, crying out for help in the depth of despair. The kind of person you would expect Jesus to answer right away. But not one word. Is that even Possible? It seems so contrary to the nature of our Lord's ministry. She's crying aloud and the streets are, are ringing with her cries and pleas. And Jesus walks on. 
a crying sinner, and a silent Savior. How is that possible? Well, you say the woman's going to go home now. Because what the people told her has happened. They said, he's not going to hear you. He's not going to listen to you. I mean, think about if this was you. You go with him with your problem. You cry out. You lay yourself before the Lord and not a word. You would at least have doubt. Oh, but this woman, this woman does not. You see, listen, don't miss this. True faith, true faith can't go home. True faith can't turn its back on Jesus. It only finds hope in Jesus. Now, by nature, we're not that way. By nature, we can live without Jesus. Well, it kind of goes like this. Well, as long as Jesus gives me a job, some food on my table, the necessities of life, and maybe a few extras, if, if he gives me these things and keeps me healthy and gives me some means, then, well, I really don't mind, but Jesus, he can keep his distance. But we don't want to get too involved. We don't want to get too religious. And we want the benefits, but we don't want to get too close. It's okay if he keeps his distance. Listen, true faith is not this way. True faith needs Jesus. True faith can't be without Jesus. The silence of Jesus is the greatest burden to bear. Samuel Rutherford, a Scottish divine, said this, quote, silence for the believer is hell. Silence for the believer is hell. The silence of God. Have you ever struggled with that? There are so many in our modern day who present Christianity as, oh, it's smiling and happy and wealthy and healthy and bubbly and you always get what you want and you always get it right away. Can I tell you, friend, that is not biblical Christianity. Have you ever cried out to God in silence? Not a word. You see, true faith knows what it means to find the Lord, and true faith knows what it is to miss the Lord. Silent. He answered her, not a word. Well, why would God be silent? Well, what are we to do with the silence, the silences of God in our lives? Well, let me give you a few thoughts. Notice here. First, we need to understand in the midst of silence, that God is sovereign. We never know all the whys, do we? Why? That's a question we ask. But God is so much bigger than us. You know, I thought of a way to illustrate it, and I, I really, years ago, I haven't done this in, in a number of years, but I used to love putting puzzles together. Those great big puzzles, the 5,000, 6,000 piece puzzles. And, you know, and I really enjoyed working on those. And our lives are kind of like that, like one of these big 5,000 piece puzzles. And, you know, when we're putting one of those puzzles together, we can only work with one or two pieces at a time, right? We try to find out where it goes and we search and we only work with one or two pieces, and we try to make them fit. But you know, God, God sees the puzzle, the complete puzzle. He knows what he's doing, and his goal is to make a beautiful picture of his work of grace in you. You see, we never know the reasons why. God does what he does. He knows what he's doing. God has so much more capability in than us. The Bible says he knows the beginning from the end. And so we humble ourselves before God and know that he is in control and he knows what he's doing. The Bible even says, who are you, old man, to reply to God? God knows what he's doing. We are the clay. 
He is the potter, and we must submit to him. He is sovereign. You know, for an unconverted person, a person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus, the sovereignty of God is a threat. They don't like that truth. Why? Because they want to be their own God. We don't want God to rule over us. We want to be God. And don't tell me about this all-sufficient, all-supreme God. But for the believer, sovereignty is one of the most comforting doctrines in the Bible. That God knows what he's doing and all of my trial and all of my suffering and the times of silence. When God does not answer, he knows what he is doing. Well, notice second, what do we do with these silences? Well, we understand that God uses silences so that he may get glory. Remember the story and you know it is familiar in John 11, the story of Lazarus, raising Lazarus from the dead. And I want to read a verse out of John 11, 5, and 6. Notice what it says. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he heard that he was sick. He stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now Jesus loved this family. He was close to them, and had this verse, I mean, this verse kind of is confusing because Jesus hears that his friend is sick and he, he tarries for two days. He's silent, really, for two days. I mean, think about it. If one of your loved ones were sick unto death, would you wait two days? I mean, if your mom or dad or sister or child and they said, hey, they're lying sick, they're at the point of death, would you go, well, I'll be there. In a couple of days. No, you would get up right then and make plans to get to them. But these two sisters didn't understand why Jesus delayed. Both of them asked. They asked Jesus when he finally arrived. Hey, if you hadn't delayed, if you hadn't have waited these days to come, our brother wouldn't have died. You could have healed him. Well, here's the question. Why was Jesus silent? Well, look at John 11 verse 4. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. There's your answer. You see, God does, does God get more glory by answering all of your prayers right away or by delaying to the point that you have almost abandoned asking God and from the ash heap he answers. God comes through and does more than you could ever ask or think. You see, does God get more glory from healing a sick Lazarus or raising a dead Lazarus to life again? Is that not true in your own life? You see, we have this so wrong because we always think that God is there to serve us. That God is there to serve us. But instead, what we are here to do is to serve him for his glory. We got it right the opposite. God is not here to serve you. You are here to glorify him. And if he gets more glory by waiting through suffering, then we wait. Well, notice the third thing about the silence of God. We need to understand that God uses silence to develop our faith. To mature our faith. God matures us. God refines us through silence. Listen, friend, we need those pauses, silences. You say, why? It's how God grows us. We need the dark times. We need the silences. I mean, what if God was at your ever beckoning call? We would be so immature in our faith. The Bible says he answered her, not a word. It's how we grow. And as God seems to push her away with one hand, seemingly, apparently, God's promises doesn't fail. God is seemingly pushing her away, but God is secretly drawing her to himself. You know, every mature Christian I know has had their share of afflictions, their share of trials and difficulties. 
But God matures us through answering, not a word. Now, let me make this clear. It's not a real silence. It is not a real silence. It's an apparent silence. Because even though it's seemingly he's silent, he's wooing, he's drawing, he's working. Well, now you say, well, now Jesus is going to answer this woman. No. No, there's a second book. Number two on your outline, Jesus develops her faith through apparent rejection. So first, he's silent. He answers her not a word. But second, we have this apparent rejection. Look at verse 24, Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I want you to notice verse 23 also. The disciples reject her too. Look at verse 23. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. I mean, here's a double rejection. Here, this poor heathen woman coming to Jesus and his disciples. The disciples say, We don't want that kind around. Send her away, Lord. He's crying after us. I mean, here again, we see the selfishness, the proud indifference of the disciples. You say, well, why are they saying this? Well, they're selfish because they have just come from Jerusalem, and they almost got arrested because in Jerusalem there was clamor around Jesus. And here is a woman who is crying out. The streets are ringing with her cries and drawing attention to Jesus and the disciples. And they're thinking, we're going to get arrested. They're selfish. They're proud. Here's why I know they're proud. Because they say, she cries out after us. No, disciples, they're not crying out. She's not crying out after you. She's crying out after Jesus. They were indifferent because you know what they say? It's send her away. We don't care about her. We care about ourselves. They, they were not to be this way, but we understand them. We don't excuse them, but we can relate. But what's really confusing is what Jesus said. In verse 24, he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So here is an apparent rejection. You say, well, why does Jesus seemingly reject her? That's the difficult part. Well, we've got to make a distinction here between Christ's priestly work as Savior and the promised seed in whom all the nations would be blessed. And we have to make a distinction between that and his prophetic work and his own temporary ministry upon earth that was confined to the Jews. And there's a twofold ministry of Jesus that we must understand. There was a ministry within the bounds of Israel for the Jews, but there was coming a day when he would die on a cross, he would rise again, he would be sent back to heaven, and the Bible says he would send the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the walls of partition would be broken down between Jew and Gentile, and the gospel would go into all the world, and all could be saved, the heathen, the Jew, everyone, the whole world. Jesus was saying to her when he said this, you're acting out of turn. You're actually raiding the table in the middle of the meal. I haven't sent the Holy Spirit yet. I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But you see, that doesn't help this one. There's three qualifications there. Lost, sheep, and house of Israel. Now this woman is lost, but she's not a sheep. And she's not of the house of Israel. So she's rejected. She has no natural right, no citizenship rights. So now what does she do? You might say, well, she find, now she goes home. He's finally spoken. The silence is broken. And what does he do? He rejects her. Rejection's hard, isn't it? I mean, to be rejected by somebody, we don't like that. That's tough stuff. I mean, young people, you think, young people who face rejection and Sometimes we'll 
have relationships with people and we'll say, well, I've been rejected by that person, and but I can live without them. But what about when Jesus rejects? Think about that. What then? You need him. There's no other answer. That's a huge trial. Well, what does faith do then? I mean, here, he hasn't spoken a word. She cries out. He says nothing. Now, he's seemingly saying, hey, I, I came to the lost house of the sheep of Israel. Well, what does faith do? Well, look at verse 25, and this is amazing. Then she came. <laughs> she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Then she came. After the silence, after she was rejected, she came. See, listen, faith comes closer to Jesus in the face of rejection. Faith says, I will not let you go. I will keep clinging to you. That is faith. This woman is the New Testament Jacob. She is wrestling with God. She is wrestling with Jesus and she will not let him go. She's thrown out the front door and she comes through the back and she says, Lord, I will not let you go. You see, faith that is being developed, faith that is being mature, clings to Jesus. It worships him. Worship means all my affections, all my love, all my passion will go to Jesus. She says, give me Jesus, else I perish. She worships him. She can't be without Jesus. It's amazing. And she says to Jesus, Lord, help me. That's a simple, sweet prayer, isn't it? Lord, help me. It's just three words, a three-word prayer. It's all it is. Anybody can pray that prayer, and I love it because the word help is the link between two words. Lord, help me. The link between Lord and me is help. You see, Jesus is both God and man, Almighty God to help us. And he is a man. He is the great helper between God and man. The Lord Jesus. Lord, help me. Lord, you are a Jewish Messiah. She doesn't say help my daughter. Hey, something's happened. She doesn't say help my daughter. What's happening now? She says, Lord, help me. What's happening is Jesus is developing her faith. He's teaching her to rely fully upon him rather than herself. It's interesting that in every account in the gospel, when a parent brings a child to Jesus to heal, heal their child, the child is forgotten and Jesus deals with the parent. We're going to come to it in Mark 9. There's a demon-possessed boy, and a man brings him, a father brings him to the Lord, and he says, Lord, my son is possessed with the devil. And Jesus says, if you will only believe, all things are possible. And the father cries out, and he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. You see, Christ is dealing with the father, not the demon-possessed boy. And now in this story, the daughter is forgotten for a moment and Jesus is dealing with the mother. You know, I thought, I wonder if, if this is not one of the reasons why God gives us children to deal with us. I mean, is there any parent listening today and you're the perfect parent? You'd say, I, I'm perfect. No, none of us are. Why? Why does God make you so dependent on him with your children? Why does God reveal so many of my faults and flaws through my children? <laughs> it reveals my sinful heart. Could it be so that we might cry out like this woman? Lord, help me! So that our faith might be developed. 
but you're Oh, Lord, help me to live my life before my children because I fail so miserably. I fall so short. I'm not what I need to be. I cry out, God, help me. Lord, help me. That ought to be the cry of every parent. I cry out to you, oh God. Change me. Make me like, my, like you. Help me, Lord. Mature my faith. Develop my faith. This is this woman. Why did Jesus seem to reject her? To develop her faith. To bring her to a place of worship and dependency upon him. You say, well, now everything's going to be okay. Jesus is going to say, okay, your daughter's healed. Go home. No, no, no. One more but. One more test. Notice number three. One more trial. Jesus matures her faith. Through apparent insult. Look at verse 26, what the Bible says. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now what's Jesus doing? Well, in those days, Jews called Gentiles dogs. It was a term of insult. You say, well, why in the world would Jesus do that? That's what he is, it seems to be saying. It's not fitting to take the bread that's the Jews and cast it to the dogs, to a Gentile woman like you. Well, the answer lies in that Jesus is developing this woman's faith. She doesn't have the right to have her daughter healed. She doesn't have the right to have her sins forgiven. She is unworthy. You see, we must understand that we don't deserve anything from his hand. But Jesus has not taught her yet that she is a vile, wretched, unworthy sinner. Oh, listen, we've got to be brought to that place. She brings our, her need to Jesus, and Jesus is bringing her to the place to see herself as she really is, to show her her need. You see, a dog was considered an unclean animal. They were just beginning to bring dogs into the house. We think about dogs, and we have them in our home, and they're pets, and we love them and play with them, but not in biblical times. They were considered unclean. And what Jesus is doing here in this verse, he is calling this woman a dog, an unclean Gentile dog. Now what is she doing? Well, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. She's going to storm away now, defend herself. I'm tired of this. No more insults. And goes home mad and say, how dare you, Jesus, say that about me. But here's the amazing thing. And friend, to be honest, this is touching to me. In verse 27, here's what she said. Look what she said. And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. That's amazing. True, Lord. I'm a dog. It's amazing. What is she doing? She's confessing. True, Lord. I am a filthy, wretched sinner. And whatever you say, you can't say enough bad things. True, Lord. True. Whatever you say, Lord, I'm worse Yet, oh, can I ask you today, have you come to that place? Have you come to that place seeing yourself for who you really are? That's a mark of saving faith, a mark of developing faith. Have we come to that place? I can, cannot tell you how many people through the years have been angry. I've had people get up and stomp out and slam doors. I've had people attack me verbally through when I preach simply because I preach about sin. I preach about depravity. And I've had people go, so you just talk about sin, sin, sin. Depravity, wretchedness, vileness. It's so negative, so negative. Why do you preach that? It's because we've got to see our need. We've got to see our need. We have to acknowledge it like this woman did. What did the Lord do? He said, you are a Gentile dog. And she said, yes, Lord. Yes, I am. I'm a sinner. I'm a wretch. If you say I'm vile, Lord, I'm vile. 
fall to your knees. The woman's saying, Lord, you can't put me low enough. True, Lord. Now listen to what the woman says. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She says, Jesus, even a hardened master to let a few crumbs fall off the edge to feed the little dogs. She's saying, Lord, will you not let a few crumbs fall off from the boundaries of Israel to this Gentile dog? I'm not asking to raid the meal. I'm not asking to sit at the table. I just want some crumbs. Crumbs. You have said, Lord, I'm a dog and a dog I am if you'll let me be your dog, Lord. Oh, that we would come to this place in our lives to see how unworthy we are, to see how bankrupt we are, how wretched we are but to claim God's truth for the saving of our souls. Martin Luther said of her answer in verse 27, he said, by a master stroke, she ensnared Christ in his own words. And then Luther said, and how Christ loves to be ensnared in his own words. <laughs> I'm unworthy, Lord. You see, this is the way, and I, I read this, how we argue with holy argumentation, pulling down the promises of God. True, Lord, I'm blind, but are you not the eye salve for the blind? True, Lord, I'm poor, but are you not rich, Lord, so that poor sinners may be rich through you? You see, this is holy argumentation. True, Lord, I'm foolish. But are you not wisdom? True, Lord. True, I'm weak. But are you not strong? True, Lord, I'm a sinner. But are you not the Savior? This woman says, true, Lord. I'm a dog. I'm a Gentile dog. But don't you have some crumbs that can fall off the table for me? You see, she took Christ at her own word bringing his own promises to him. You see, God loved to see his word. And then we come to the climax of the story in verse 28. It says, Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What does Jesus say to this woman? Great is your faith. Mature is your faith. Developed is your faith. And what Jesus does is he takes the keys out of his pocket and he gives them to her. And this woman goes to the storehouse and her life is changed. Jesus said, let it be as you have desired. Can you imagine going home and there's a little girl and she's whole. There's no more demons in her. And what a joyous occasion that would have been. The little girl had been healed totally and completely. This woman, she grew out of the storehouse of God's riches. And she was blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Mark 7, 30. Mark's account said, And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone and her daughter lying on the bed. But you know what? A greater miracle took place for this Canaanite woman. An inner miracle happened in this woman's life. And you know, I thought as I studied this text and looked at these truths, does not this pagan Canaanite woman put us to shame? She hears some rumors about Jesus and she goes to Jesus and she will not let him go. Jesus is developing her faith. Despite all the obstacles, she wouldn't stop. She's so mature. Jesus is mature in her. Listen, that is the true nature of saving faith. And Lord, help us to see you in everything. You say, well, how is it possible, David, that this woman received all of this? Her life transformed. Her daughter healed. This unworthy pagan sinner you know why? Because Jesus faced the real silence. The real silence. You say, what do you mean? 
on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God, his Father, answered him not a word. Silence. Silence on Calvary. You see, Jesus faced the real rejection. The beating, the slapping, the spitting, the crucifixion. He faced the insults, the call the devil a criminal. He faced the real thing so that we could come behind him. And he matures our faith. He develops our faith to make us like him. Thank God for Jesus today. Thank God for the cross, for the sacrifice that he made for sinners, that he became sin for us. How does Jesus develop our faith? Through apparent silence, through apparent rejection, through apparent insult. And when you face the afflictions in life, know that he's at work. Know that he's working. And as he is seemingly pushing you away, he's drawing you to himself. I'm going to ask you today, do you have that kind of faith? This great faith? What did Jesus say? Oh, woman, great is your faith. I think we can say today this is a great faith, faith that saves. And as I close this morning, I want to make an appeal, an appeal that I make every week because I want to urge you today that if you don't know Jesus, if you're not saved, you might be just like this woman in this text and you've got a mess on your hands, problems all over the place. Well, you know what? Jesus never saved anybody he didn't change. Totally and completely. You need to come to Jesus just like this woman today. Her life was changed and he can change you. You say, well, what do I need to do, David? You need to cry out, Lord, help me. You need to repent of your sins. Turn from your sins. Turn from your will and way and savingly believe. You know, repentance and faith. I've been doing some study about this because I'm going to teach a series on repentance. Repentance, you can't have repentance without faith and you can't have faith without repentance. They're the same, different sides of the same coin. But what you need to do today, you need to repent. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus and savingly Believe him. You must place your faith in his payment to save your soul. You must forsake all trust in yourself for salvation. You must commit your life to Jesus alone. How Jesus develops our faith. What a blessed, blessed gospel story. Can I pray with you this morning as we close? Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful story of this Canaanite woman. Lord, when we really think about it, it really is a touching story. But God, how you changed her life eternally. And Father, I pray today that you would do this very same thing in every person's life today that's listening. God, develop our faith, mature our faith. For those, Lord, who are out there listening this morning and they've never truly been changed by you. Oh, God, reveal to them their great, great need. Show them they're, they're a sinner, Lord. Show them their rebellion, their violence, their wretchedness. And show them a sweet, loving, wonderful Savior who can save their eternal soul. We pray, Lord, that souls would be saved, that believers would be encouraged and strengthened this Lord's day through the word of God. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer.